the, the Son of God? How is that a claim to be God? Okay. Jesus did in fact claim to be the Son of God. Uh, he claimed many other things as well uh, that pointed to his claim to deity. I think the important thing here is that we put this into context, recognising that Jesus was a learned Jew, talking to other learned Jews. Uh, The Jews do not use the term God lightly. This is on the heels of of centuries of prophecy about the coming Messiah, the, the Son who would be born, who will be called Mighty God. Now, now, we've got to make it clear here that, that there's only one God to the Jews. They don't, they don't use the term like our society does, the term, the concepts of God. There's one created God. So when Jesus comes along centuries later, claiming that he is the Son of God, claiming things such as when he said, I and the Father are one, when Jesus said this, It was clear that he knew what he meant and it was clear that they knew what he meant, the Jews, because it was at this time that they said, we are stoning you. They tried to stone him to death. We are stoning you because you, a mere man, claim to be God. All he had to say was, no, no, you misunderstand me. This is like all the other occasions where he made this claim and they tried to kill him. And In fact, that's exactly why he was crucified eventually. Tell us plainly. Tell us, are you the son of God? Now, it's important to to recognise this this context of the Jewish understanding or the the seriousness which they use the term God. Uh, the, The Apostle Thomas called Jesus my Lord and my God. And Jesus says, because you have seen me, you have believed. He didn't say, look, you're breaking the third commandment, misusing the name of God. You know, Jesus was very specific about which God, which concept of God he was claiming to be. He even claimed the very personal name of God handed down to Moses by God on, the, on Mount Sinai, when Moses asks him, what, what's your name? What do I tell the Israelites? Your name is. God said, tell the Israelites, I am has sent you. In other words, I am was his name. When Jesus comes along 1,500 years later and tells the Jews that he existed 2,000 years ago, that he existed, he said, before Abraham existed, I am. And again, they took up stones to stone him. The reason that they tried to kill him on each of these occasions is because a claim to be God, if it was untrue, the penalty was death. It's there in their law, in the Leviticus law, Leviticus chapter 24, verse 13 and 14. The context in answer to your question is really the important thing. I was in discussion with a a Hindu fellow over this and, and He agreed after looking at the context, the historical context, that Jesus clearly, in claiming to be the Son of God, was claiming to be God. He agreed that that both of that was clear. But he said to me, what if, what if Jesus was claiming to be the Son of God in the Hindu concept or understanding of Son of God, in that we're all sons of God in that concept? And I said, well, that's, that's a fair question. But I said to him, what if I said to you, I'm going to the footy on Saturday? I said, which code of football would I be referring to? And he said, you would be referring to Aussie rules. (laughs) And I said, hang on, wait a minute. I didn't even say the word football. I didn't say the word football. How do you know I'm not talking about soccer or rugby or American football? He said, well, you know, you're a a Melbourne man. It was the middle of winter. It was back in the mid-90s. And he said, in that context, it's it's obvious you would be talking about Australian Reels football. And I said, that's right, because there isn't any other kind of football, pal. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I didn't exactly say that last bit to him. But anyway, I said to him... That's correct. And what's more, in 2,000 years' time, if people bothered 
to look back at the context of a Melbourne man around the turn of the millennium claiming that he was going to the footy on Saturday, even though he didn't use the word football, even though you might even know, not know what the word footy is in 2,000 years' time, if you bother to look at the context, there will be no question that I'll be talking about Australian rules football. And I said, if you bother anyone who bothers to look at the context in the New Testament of what Jesus was claiming, there is no question that he was claiming to be God in this claim to be the Son of God. He was claiming to be co-eternal with the Father from before the world began. Actually, just, just one more point on, on, on that issue. What amazes me is the amount of people who <clears throat> have an opinion, probably everybody here tonight has got some sort of, most people here tonight would have some sort of opinion on who Jesus is or his claims without having actually read the New Testament, the source document. I mean, you wouldn't treat any other subject in the world like this, would you? I mean, you know, people, uh, they've got their, um, their firm opinions. If we were perhaps discussing tonight uh, a movie or a book and people had strong opinions and later on we find out some of these people had strong opinions had never even read the book. Now, wouldn't you be a bit embarrassed, you know? And yet people seem to not be that embarrassed about having strong opinions about who Jesus or his claims without ever having bothered to look at the context, actually read the New Testament, not a very long book. Or, you know, they'll, they'll say, um, well, you know, I think it's all a matter of interpretations, you know. It's all a matter of interpretations. People who say, you know, it's all a matter of interpretations but have never actually read it or, you know, I read it when I was a kid, you know. That's the one I really love. You ever know, heard that? I read it when I was a kid. Now, you wouldn't treat any other subject in the world like this, would you? Can you imagine you're, you're, um, <laughs> you're studying English literature... At university, you've got, um, you're studying Shakespeare and the professor or the lecturer says, OK, we're going to study Macbeth. Everybody has to read Macbeth. And you go, oh, sorry, not me. Read it when I was a kid. <laughs> you wouldn't treat any other subject in the world like this. And in answer to your question, I believe that anybody who bothers to look in the context, read the whole context, it's clear that Jesus did claim to be the Son of God, but that was a claim to be co-eternal God with the Father. Could Jesus have been a reincarnation of other enlightened teachers, such as Buddha? Okay. Um, well, no, because uh, his, uh, his own teaching would refute the idea of, of reincarnation. It's appointed to man to die once, and after that to face judgment. Even his, uh, his resurrection is a refuting of the idea of reincarnation because resurrection was a forerunner for, for, for those who believe. And uh, he said, see, here it is, I myself, not someone else. Uh, even the Dalai Lama makes the point that you can't believe in reincarnation and resurrection at the same time. They can't both be, you can't be coming back as yourself and as someone else at the same time. Uh, an enlightened teacher... Uh, you know, when we think of uh, enlightened ones, I have to say that, that Jesus' claim was the exact opposite of being an enlightened one. The opposite of being an enlightened one. See, an enlightened one, as we understand it, is someone who, who goes through a spiritual progression uh, upward to reach a stage of enlightenment. Now, I'm not going to enter the, the argument of how would you... If you, you, you've never been enlightened, how would you know when you got there? But the point is that even if you accept that, Jesus' claim is he, was the exact opposite. He claimed that he wasn't someone who started off imperfect and, and worked his way up. He claimed that he was God, already perfect, who humbled himself to become a mere human being. Let me uh, quote to you from the book of Philippians. It says that, Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. grasped. So he didn't say, you know, take on all my rights as God. But made himself nothing, taking on the very nature of a servant, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. 
So, so this is not only the opposite of, of an upward progression, it's a condescending, a descending, a condescending, but also helps actually explain a lot of the questions that we might have if you, you read the New Testament and you see clearly Jesus, or even though on occasions he's claiming to be God, uh, other occasions as the Son of God, he's clearly claiming to be dependent on God, praying to God. Uh, how does that fit? Well, it fits exactly on what, what I'm pointing out here in this uh, making himself nothing. He took on the limitations so that he would be a full substitute as a human being to ident identify with and save man. So it's the exact opposite of an enlightened one. So answer to your question, uh, no, he definitely could not have uh, been a reincarnation. He, he refutes that and uh, his claim was the opposite of an upward progression of enlightenment. Why couldn't you apply the, um, the logic of um, liar or lunatic to other great religious teachers? Okay. Well, you couldn't because they didn't make this kind of claim about themselves. Uh, for instance, uh, just say, for instance, that you don't agree with or believe in the teachings of the Buddha. And in fact, you may, may believe that he has no right to the authority of his teachings at all. Uh, you're not forced into a position of specifically thinking of him as either a liar or a lunatic any more than anybody else, uh, just in the same way. In fact, you may even... Uh, uh, you could have a distant uh, acknowledgement or respect, if you like, in the same way that you might look at a great political leader, leader that you disagree with totally. You, you know, take someone, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev was a great leader of the communist people. Now, you might hate communism. You might not agree with it at all. You might, might think it's, a, it's an evil. But that doesn't mean that you, you kill, still can't acknowledge uh, that this guy was obviously a, a good leader in the human sense. There's no question of that, you know? Um, the same with these other religious teachers. You, you're not forced into questioning specifically whether they, were, they had to be liars or lunatics. But when someone claims to be God, you can't respect it and reject it at the same time. Uh, isn't it true that uh, the Bible is a book that's, you know, like children tell a story, they tell it to somebody else and then they tell it to somebody else and after it's gone through six or seven people, the story's been lost? Oh. How, how, how reliable are the source documents, the New Testament and Old Testament? Okay. Okay, yep. Uh, well, for starters, the Bible wasn't actually... Um, it was written by eyewitnesses, people who were there and willing to lay their lives on the line for it, right? And that's, that's, that's the first point, to make the point. If we took a purely academic uh, answer to your question and looked at uh, those who are involved in the, in, the, um, in the disciplines of this kind of investigation, you would look at uh, the age of the manuscripts and the number of manuscripts. Now, based on those things alone, uh, the New Testament alone is, is so far above in terms of accuracy than any other document in the history of the ancient world, it wouldn't be enough. Just taking the number of manuscripts alone, that's the two main criteria they use. It would not be enough to say the New Testament was 10 times more accurate than any other document in the history of the ancient world. It would not be enough to say it was 100 times more accurate. You'd have to say it was thousands, there are thousands more manuscripts than any other document from the ancient world. Uh, you know, it's, um, it's amazing how... I, I remember saying that to a, to a Christian years ago. Uh, you know, oh, look, you know, this Bible you're reading, it's been handed down over the centuries. You know, how do you know, you know it wasn't changed? Written by the journos of the day, how do you know it wasn't changed around, you know? And one day I actually asked myself, where was I getting this information from? You know, I heard someone say it, of course, you know, current affair or somewhere, I don't know. But uh, I decided to look into the facts. The facts are that there is a portion of, the, of a manuscript of the New Testament sitting in John Ryland's museum in Manchester, England right now, dated within about 25 years of the last of the apostles. Now, then you've got writings of uh, the early church leaders, Clement, Polycarp, Ignatius. These guys, 
You can take a guy like Clement. Here's a guy who lived during the time of the Apostles, writing in the 90s AD, when at least the Apostle John would have still been alive. He's quoting most of the books of the New Testament. Now, what did this guy have? Mental telepathy? He's writing something that hasn't been written for a couple hundred years or got, got changed around and stuff, you know? Uh, the amazing thing is, if you, if you compare it to any other... Um, other document. I mean, the people involved in these kinds of historical investigations say that if it was a secular document, you wouldn't even be able to question its accuracy and its, its miraculous way it's, it's come down preserved as they dig up older and older manuscripts. And no other document from the ancient world has the age that you could even check up. The writings of Plato and these kind of guys, you know, the oldest manuscripts are within about a thousand years of the, of the actual writings compared to the New Testament. You know, as a guy, a scientist called Henry Morris put it this way, he said, you know, in relation to the, to the age and, the, um, and the, uh, the number of manuscripts, he said there's more evidence for, for the person and teaching of Jesus Christ than any other person in the history of the world prior to the invention of printing. Uh, you know, all that I've said is the academic answer, and it is uh, impressive academically, but you know that's not actually the bottom line answer to your question. The bottom line answer to your question is, comes back to the person, the historical person of Jesus Christ himself. See, what, um, what, what, what it really comes back to is the integrity of Jesus. Was he telling the truth or not? You see, you can't have your cake and eat it too. You can't believe that he told the truth and that the Bible got changed around. That's illogical because then you've got an imaginary son of God sitting up there in heaven going, well, I gave him my teaching and now I'm stuck up in heaven. And they're changing around, I can't do a thing about it. I'm stuck here, you know. Well, that's an imaginary nonsense, right? Um, so I would say, bottom line answer to your question is the integrity of Jesus himself and he put his stamp of approval on it, uh, apart from all this other academic uh, backup. If God wanted to give us a message, why didn't he just tell us? Uh, what were you hoping for, an email or a uh, <laughs> uh, message on your answering machine, maybe? Um, um, OK. <clears throat> now, it's a fair question. If God wanted to give us a message, why didn't he just tell us? Well, the answer is that he did. In fact, he came in person. And we nail him to a cross. Uh, you know, I think it was uh, Socrates who said, if there was ever such a person and it was perfect, we would murder him. You know, that was pretty prophetic. The point, the point of uh, Jesus becoming a man is not so much the method of the message, but what he came to do. Even if we took that idea, you know, something that we might think of more objective, hey, if I could get a voice from the sky or a sign in the sky or something, a voice from heaven, is that really more objective? You know, in a year's time you might be thinking, well, was that voice really, maybe it was in my head. In contrast to that, what we've been looking at is historical facts and they're historical facts that are not going anywhere. You can check up on them. You can examine them. Uh, this is not some point in history, uh, obscure little point. This was not something that was done in a corner, you know. Uh, this is a standout in history. You know, central events in the New Testament even recorded in non-Christian history. Jesus divides history. He's the most influential person in history. The majority of people in history have been influenced by his teachings, even people who don't even realise it. He's the most famous person in history. Jesus is uh, the, the book of his life and teachings is the biggest selling book in history. His, uh, Jesus founded the largest religion in history. Um, I mean, this is not something hidden in history. I mean, we're living about 2,000 years since what? We even count the years of history by his life. And of course, Jesus is the only person in history who ever claimed to be God and have it taken seriously on a world scale. So my answer really to your question is, this is not some obscure message done in a corner. This is, um, this is big time in history. Aren't there thousands of different religions and possibilities? Okay, well there's definitely thousands of different religions. Uh, 
In actual fact, there's, there's five major world religions of which most religious thought come out of in the world. There's really five major world religions. Alphabetically, Buddhism, Christianity, Hinduism, Islam and Judaism. Okay, that's the five major world religions. Uh, thousands of possibilities. If I, uh, if I take uh, the professing numbers of those religions, right, and I'm not pretending for a moment that people who profess to belong to a religion necessarily follow it, but just, just as a statistic, there are two billion people who profess to be Christians in the world. That, that's about one in every three people. Now, all of the other four major world religions put together add up to about that, two billion. Uh, two billion and two billion. Now, just over two billion, right? I'm, only, I'm not trying to make anything out of that other than the point that I do want to make in answer to your question. There are two basic religious thoughts in the world. There's a belief in God and there's a belief in the self. And now the belief in the self might, might include... A belief in God. It might include uh, devout religious practice. In fact, it might include a lifetime of dedicated religious practice and belief in God, even a, a, a sort of a belief in Jesus as well, right? But the bottom line of that belief comes down to this, that whether it's my relationship with God or whether I believe I'm going to go to heaven or nirvana, whatever the religion is it comes down to the concept that I'm good enough. I'm good enough to get there. And maybe I'm not good enough yet, I've just got to work harder at this religion to get there, at being a good person, or whatever it is. I'm good enough. And, you know, this, I might need God's help in this, so it might be in part only, you know. I need mostly God's help, but I'm not good enough yet, I'll get there. It's a belief that I will obtain this righteousness that I need, if only in part from myself. And therefore it's called self-righteousness. Okay? Self -right now this self-righteousness might take on a more, you know, agnostic approach. You know, um, sort of, well, I don't know if it's a God or not, but, you know, well, you know, if there is a heaven, I reckon, you know, it should be okay. You know? In other words, I'm good enough. Self-righteousness. Or, or, you know, I'll do the best I can. What more can you do that? I'll do the best I can. So you reckon your best is good enough. Self-righteousness. Or, or I'll take my chances. You know, I'll take my chances. What can I do? I don't know about this stuff, so I'll take my chances when I get there. So you reckon you're good enough that you've got a chance of being good enough. Self-righteousness. Or it might, the self-righteousness can take on a more humble approach too, you know, sort of... Uh, Look, you know, I know I'll be right with God. What I'll do is when I get there, I'll ask for forgiveness. I'll ask for forgiveness. So you reckon that you're good enough that you deserve to be forgiven. Self-righteousness. So it always comes back to, even if only in part, I'm relying on myself. Self-righteousness. And, and I have to include, actually, in that, that the self-righteousness can sort of... Uh, B, well, look, you know, I'm good enough to get there because, you know, I do, I'm a good person and you're not. So it's a, a religion of pride too. That's one religious system that encompasses a lot of uh, religious thought, but it's, it's one religious thought. The other one is belief in God alone. The belief that I'm not good enough, that I will never, ever be good enough. That no matter how many good things I do, I deserve to account and pay for the times I haven't done right. And here's the humbling part. I need a saviour. I need the saviour. I need to believe in this saviour. And I need to believe in this saviour for all of my life, not just the bits I agree with. Not just the bits that suit me. I need to believe, full stop. Two religions and possibilities. Belief in the self or belief in God alone. If God is a God of love, why is there a hell with weeping and gnashing of teeth? Okay. Uh, 
Well, for starters, I, I need to point out that the most loving being of the universe, if he's ever walked the face of this earth, Jesus spoke about hell more than any of the other apostles or any other New Testament writers. But I would uh, ask the question, how could a God be a God of love and not have a hell in light of the fact that, well, let's look at reality, not fantasy land. Is there or is there not a lot of suffering and evil in this world? How could a God of love look out at that and go, oh, just don't worry about it, she'll be right. I don't believe it's uh, possible a God could be love and be indifferent to that. Well, the God of the Bible is not indifferent to that. He's not overlooking any of it, including down to the very last detail of the thoughts in our head. You know, a judge who would overlook, um, you know, say a murderer comes before him and he says, you know, look, you've murdered, but look, I forgive you, don't worry about it, on your way, don't worry, you know. That's not a God of, a judge of love or a forgiving judge. That's a, that's a corrupt judge and the God of the Bible is not corrupt. You know, the thing about hell is that people think of it as this cruel place where the really bad people go, but the Bible describes it simply as a place of justice where each one according to the things they have done. You know, um, so degrees. You know, people always say that old joke about, yeah, I don't mind going to hell, I'll be with all my mates, you know. Um, well, uh, the news is, <laughs> like, the, actually, the nearest human analogy is jail. Just like if you, if you go to jail, you know, you don't necessarily go to be with all your mates, even if you've got mates who are also somewhere else in jail. You know, um, jail's a good example because even the people in jail think jail is a good thing. Now, they don't think it's a good place to be. In fact, they might say, hey, look, you know, I shouldn't be or I'm innocent, but all these other writers should be, you know. In other words, even the people in jail agree that jail is a good thing because they agree with the concept of justice, and so do we. We think jail is a good thing, not a good place, but a good thing. And in jail, what have you got? You've got different degrees according to what you've done. You've got your H division, your solitary confinement, you've got your uh, low security, you know, depending on what you have done. In, in the case of the Bible, also depends on how much you know. So God is not caught out in, term, in that way. You know, the thing is, I, I know someone who's in jail at the moment, this lady who... Uh, she st stabbed her husband 64 times. Couldn't turn the electric knife off, you know, sort of. <laughs> um, no, sorry, that's an old joke. I forget that. Um, <clears throat> now, I do actually know someone who's in jail at the moment. And so he's just waiting up the back there. Um, <clears throat> and this guy's in a low security. Now, he, the fence is so low he could jump over it and if he wanted to escape, you know. He didn't commit a major crime, but he's in jail. Now, in jail, he's, um, he's doing a computer course, he goes to the gymnasium, he's got colour telly, you know, going, ah, come on, that's uh, terrible. But can I tell you something? It's still jail. He's separated from his family, and you know that there is weeping and gnashing of teeth going on in that jail right now as we're here. Weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's weeping and sadness over what's happened and there's gnashing of teeth in anger and regret over the wrong choices that were made. So this weeping and gnashing of teeth is not so foreign to us at all. It's happening right now. And, you know, uh, there's nothing, I don't believe, unloving about a judge who brings about justice, you know, there are, there are judges in this town this very week who have sentenced criminals to long prison terms, who have gone home and they might be very loving, forgiving family, men or women then there's nothing unloving or unforgiving about bringing about justice you know this, um, the measure of the love of God is this justice the measure of the love of God is this justice you see when uh, that same judge has a murderer before him and says, rather than don't worry about it, says, I have to worry about it. I have to give you a full penalty. Capital punishment's been reintroduced. The penalty is death. And I can't overlook justice. 
but I'll pay it for you. I'll pay it for you. And in this case, in God's case, God is both the victim as well as the judge. In other words, this murderer didn't just murder anybody. He murdered the judge's own son and the judge still gives up everything just so he can secure forgiveness and still meet justice for this person. So I say that the the measurement of the love of God is indeed his justice because he was willing to pay for it. And that's why I think it's clear that there would not be anyone complaining in hell that this is unfair, unjust. Who could complain to a judge who you can stand there before a judge? We always say, hey, no one's got the right to judge but God, right? No one's got the right... Well... That's true. No one's got, and the Bible says we must all stand before the judgment seat of God. In fact, it's very specific. It says we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Who could complain about a judge who would throw you into jail, who can stand there and say, I offered to pay for it and you didn't want it? Who is more qualified to throw you into a jail than a judge who can say, hey, I offered, you rejected it. So in answer to your question, I I think the love of God is tremendously tied up with his justice and it fits in uh, perfectly. In fact, it it makes no sense at all uh, for God of love to not have justice in light of this world that we look out upon, where the bad guys are winning. Look, I don't go to church, but I try to be as good as those people that do. Aren't there a lot of hypocrites in churches? Okay, uh, that's a good question. In fact, I remember uh, saying it to someone once years ago, you know, I'd never go to church because, you know, it's uh, full of hypocrites. And I remember they said to me, well, you know, if you ever find a church that's got no hypocrites, you know, well, don't go there because then they'll have one, you know. I said, <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's true, there are hypocrites in churches. In fact, Jesus predicted... That, that there would be hypocrites in church as he warned us in advance. Uh, but he didn't define hypocrites as people who go to church. He didn't uh, say, therefore, that we shouldn't go to church. He said the opposite. Jesus defined hypocrites as people who say that they believe and don't do what he says. Uh, the Apostle John puts it this way. He says, you know, the one who says, I know him, that is, the one who says, I believe in him, but does not do what he commands, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. In other words, he's a hypocrite, right? That means there's lots of hypocrites in churches. Uh, That is, people who say that they believe in him, they go to church, but they deliberately break other commandments of God. That's hypocrisy. But then again, People who say that they believe in him but don't go to church, they're hypocrites also because they're also deliberately breaking one of his commands. That is church going. I think the the thing to be careful of here is that we don't uh, compare ourselves to hypocrites because we're not scoring any points with other hypocrites because Jesus said no hypocrite's going to enter the kingdom of heaven. Uh, in fact, this comparison thing can get kind of dangerous in, in a sense, you know. Um, for instance, um, I might think that you are as good a person as anybody who goes to church. In fact, you might be as good a person as anybody who goes to church. But uh, the point about a true Christian is they have a substitute. A substitute. And the substitute is the standard by which we get to heaven. Perfection. Perfection. Let me give you an example. I, I, um, when I was a, a teenager, I used to play basketball in my old hometown Shepparton. Now, I was in an under-16 team. We had a, um, a season where we played against these grown men in open competition. And the late night games in Shep Sports Stadium with only one umpire, we'd be playing against these tough boys from Taligarupna. <laughs> and these guys would pick on us, pick us up and throw us off the court when the umpire wasn't looking, really pick on us. And we'd get beaten up and all this sort of stuff. Now, 
<laughs> really tough guys now to think back on a picking on a bunch of 15 year olds but anyway the point is the following season we got a new recruit on our team and his name was Gavin Cooper and he was an Aboriginal kid who was well the thing is he was an outstanding basketball player but the thing about Gavin was that he was the toughest kid in Shep <laughs> and I mean this guy he was built like a brick church you know I mean, he was, he was strong. He knew his way around a boxing ring. No adult would mess with this guy, you know? All of a sudden, we weren't getting picked on. In fact, you know, if anyone was silly enough to pick on me, you know, I'd just go, substitute, medley off, Cooper on. Deal with the substitute, buddy. If you want to pick on me, deal with the substitute. And this is what it comes back to in this comparison thing of, hey, I'm as good as any Christian. It's the substitute that you've got to deal with. You see, no Christian is better than you because they go to church. But they've got a substitute who's better than you. And if they really believe, then they go to church because they're in submission to that substitute. Arrogant to say that Jesus is the only way? Like, couldn't God have used other teachers? Okay. Well, it's not a, a statement of arrogance if it's true. It's, if it's true, it's a statement of love uh, and mercy. Uh, <clears throat> I think the thing about Jesus being the only way, a very controversial thing, is first of all, we need to point out that it's not some Christian idea. It's not, it's not Christians thought up this, right? This is not something that the Christians say, okay, we reckon we got the, like a barricade for a football team, we reckon we got the best teacher over here, he's the only way, you know? First point to make is that it's Jesus' idea. He's the one who said, I am the way and the truth and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. So the first point to make is it's, it's Jesus' idea that he's the only way. The second thing about that is, it's not enough to say that Jesus simply said he was the only way. Jesus is the only one who ever offered a way. Whoever offered a way. And all the more particularly in light of a God who's eternal and just. What, what I mean is, um, no other uh, founder or leader, or, or for that matter, any other human being ever even conceived of the concept of taking an eternity worth of judgment for their followers. No one even conceived of the concept. You know, the Buddha says in the Dhammapada, the teachings of the Buddha, he says, by oneself the evil is done. By oneself the evil is left undone. Lo, no man can purify another. So, you know, the, the concept is foreign. The concept is foreign. Uh, you know, all the religions, from their own definition at least, agree what the problem is. They say the problem is... If you do something wrong, you're going to have to pay for it. And they might have different concepts of how, but you've got to pay. Anything you've done wrong, you've got to pay. Right? So they'll agree what the problem is. And for, again, from their own definition, they, they are all trying to help stop make the problem worse. So they're saying, they're teaching you and saying, listen, you know, if you do that, again, you, you're in big trouble. It'll make you worse. Worse reincarnation, hell, the whole thing, right? So they help stop trying to make the problem worse. But what about a solution? What if you've already done these things? What if you might do them again? Or what, if, what, what about a way? <laughs> what about a, a solution? You see, Jesus is the only one who ever offered a way. You know, I mean, the, the vague hope, uh, some of them have a, you know, sort of a confused idea. Maybe good deeds will outweigh bad deeds. But even that, they're not, they're not uh, straight on this there's uh, controversy in, within those religions who even believe that. It's t just how that works. You know, of course God could have used other teachers to teach and did to teach, but if teaching is all that Jesus came to do, then his teaching is useless to us. You know, one of the most ironic things about this controversy about Jesus as the only way is that Jesus himself wanted another way. Jesus wanted another way. See, uh, <clears throat> when Jesus was 
contemplating, Jesus predicted he was going to be risen from the dead. He, he predicted he was going to be restored to glory with the Father uh, before the world be, as he was before the world began. In other words, unlike the rest of us, he knew how good it was going to be on the other side, through death. And yet, the thought of going through an eternity worth of hell, full separation, all that we would deserve, a full separation. Remember on the, on the cross he cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He experienced the full forsaking and separation from God, an eternity worth of hell. And the thought of that was so horrific to him that at the last minute he prayed to the Father and said, if there's any other way, I want out. Now he didn't put it like that. He said, my Father, if it is at all possible... If there's any other way, let this cup pass from me. And here's the key. Nevertheless, not as I will, but your will be done. In other words, he wasn't uh, piking out, as it were, but in all of his taking on humanity, he was crying out, is there any other way? Now, of course, uh, the answer, he, he, he later on said, Father, save me from this out? No. For this very reason, I've come to this hour. In other words, no, there was no other way. And he set his face towards going to that cross. But even Jesus asked that question, is there any other way? Well, no one else is eternal. No one else offered to take an eternity worth of punishment for us. Uh, Jesus is the only one who ever offered a way. And I think that's really, uh, you know, stamps out any idea of arrogance, I think. Just a uh, <coughs> make question on... The Jews, Judaism, has me curious. They were um, well represented at the time. Uh, you would say that um, Jesus would literally be the answer to their prayers. And yet, in the majority, um, in spite of being there, they chose not to follow. And um, in the present context, uh, the leaders of the Jewish church would be at least a, as knowledgeable on any of this as anybody. Uh, so there are those two questions, why they chose not to and still choose not to. And um, in uh, respect to their uh, future at uh, judgment time uh, leaves uh, an interesting question there, given that they do believe but they don't qualify. Okay. All right, so there's a couple of questions in there. Good ones. Okay. First of all, why didn't the Jews believe when, uh, when Jesus came along? First point to, to make is that, that many, many did. All, all of the first Christians uh, were Jews. Uh, that, um, you know, we read of this, uh, these, this great day of Pentecost where Peter preached to his uh, brothers and sisters in, in uh, the Jewish religion. Uh, 3,000 instantly converted later on, growing to within a few days of 5,000. All of the first Christians were Jews. And yet, uh, as pointed out, the majority did not accept Jesus as their Messiah. Well... First of all, I, I perhaps go um, and answer you, the second part of your question as well in that, in that many, uh, the majority of Jews today don't believe also. And yet, I would point out that perhaps some of you have heard of the Messianic Jews. That's Jewish people who do believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Now, they're a minority and we might think, well, they're such a minority. Is it really that big a deal? Well, I say no, because the, the Messianic Jews, the number of Messianic Jews in the world right now adds up to uh, somewhere around four to 500,000, depending on the statistics. Now, that's only um, about, you know, come up towards half a million, um, half a million Jewish people believe Jesus is a Messiah. And you say, oh, that's still a pretty small minority. 14 million Jews in the world. Now, I'd ask the question, how many of those 14 million are looking for any Messiah? How, we all, most of us, would probably know Jewish people. How many of them are religious people who are devout, looking for the Messiah, rejected Jesus the Messiah, but they're looking for another Messiah? I would suggest out of that 14 million, very few, I would suggest that out of that 14 million, half a million people following Christ out of religious Jews is quite a substantial amount. 
Jesus said it was narrow, narrow. but if you look at the Old Testament uh, before Jesus' direct teaching, we see that the path was always narrow for all of the Jews, always in the Old Testament. Most of the Jews of the Old Testament rejected God. And here comes the, the, the answer bringing those two together, those two questions together. The first century Jew majority rejected Jesus for the exact same reason that the 21st century Gentiles reject Jesus. And that's a majority too. They don't want Jesus telling them they're not good enough, that they need a saviour, that they need, they need someone else to be the lord of their life. They want to be the lord of their own life. In fact, I'll uh, just quickly... Uh, give an example from the New Testament record of Jews who believed. He was right there doing the miracles. You know, how could you miss this, right? Why wouldn't everybody jump on this? The same guys didn't want to give up their guns. Yet at the same time, Many, even among the leaders, believed in him. In other words, they saw all these miracles and all this stuff. They believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not confess their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved praise from men more than praise from God. The answer really to your question is not just for Jews. It's quite clear, not only was it a minority of Jews, but it was a minority of Gentiles, and it still is today. It was all the way through the Old Testament with the Jews, and the answer that most people will not believe is still the same. We don't want anybody else telling us what we've got to do and how we must get to heaven or any other thing. We don't want uh, Jesus telling us we'll never ever be good enough for heaven. We are not good we, we, the, the Jew, the first century Jew and the 21st century Gentile are exactly the same. I'm good enough, thanks. I'm a good person. I'm not as bad as some people. We don't want to be told that we are desperately in need of the Saviour.